All right, chapter three of Johnny Tremaine by Esther Forbes, and illustrated by Lind Ward, published by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. This is chapter three, however, we are starting section two. And just to kind of review um, <clears throat> what we read in section one is Johnny is cruising around Boston trying to find a new trade. And he stumbles into the office that produces the Boston Observer. And uh, Mr. Lapham did not take that paper uh, because he says it's wicked. And so, but Rab is the fellow in the office and he's just really a nice guy, very calming presence. And so Johnny feels at ease. And that was the first time Johnny had confided his story to anyone. So let's go. Section two. The coming of Mr. Percival Tweedy, journeyman silversmith of Baltimore, cast a longer and longer shadow over the Lapham household and conversation. While the terms of partnership were being drawn up, he stayed at a cheap lodging house on Fish Street. Johnny left right after breakfast and often did not return until dark. He did not meet Mr. Tweedy for a long time, and he got tired of hearing about him. Mr. Tre Tweedy was ready to sign the contract of partnership Mrs. Lapham had had drawn up, and Mr. Tweedy would not sign. And remember, when Johnny got injured, Mrs. Lapham had said, uh, I need to have someone come and like basically take over Johnny's spot. We need a competent silversmith who will take over this business from Mr. Lapham so that he can marry one of my, quote, poor fatherless daughters, okay? So she's really taking the reins here. She's drawing up the contract, and he won't sign it. When Mr. Tweedy came to the shop, it was Dorcas he seemed to fancy. No, it was Madge, although almost 40, he's almost 40 years old, he was still a bachelor. Mrs. Lapham had asked him about that. Johnny already hated the very sound of his name, and then one morning before breakfast, he met him. Mr. Tweedy was diffidently standing about in the shop, hoping Mrs. Lapham would ask him to breakfast. He was fingering a pocketbook sent in for a new clasp, and his stomach was rolling from hunger. Heh, said Johnny rudely. The timid creature jumped like a shot rabbit and dropped the pocketbook. <laughs> Johnny scared him. What are you doing here? The boy demanded, pretending he had caught a thief. Mr. Tweedy swallowed twice, his Adam's apple rising and falling with emotion, but said nothing. Are you a thief or are you that Tweedy man I've heard tell of? <laughs> I'm Tweedy. I'm Johnny Tremaine. You don't say. I'll tell Mrs. Lapham you're here for breakfast. I just happened by. I just thought I'd come in. He had a queer, squeaky voice. Johnny disliked him even more than he had expected. Such impotence, such timidity in a grown man irritated the boy. That means the guy just seems like he's very not manly, okay? Oh, come out with it flat, he said. You've been getting your dinners here free for two weeks, and now you're feeling out for breakfast? I don't care, not me, but I'll warn the women to put on an extra plate. <sighs> the man said nothing, but he looked at Johnny, and the look of bleak hatred amazed the boy. He had not guessed Mr. Tweedy had that much gumption in him. Mrs. Lapham came thumping down the stairs. It was her second trip to the foot of the attic ladder, and she still wasn't sure Dove and Dusty were out of bed. Everything had gone wrong. Breakfast was late. Madge had a felon on her finger and wasn't good for anything, and Dorcas was complaining because there was no butter for breakfast. She had slapped Dorcas, who had gone out back to cry. How easily, smoothly everything had gone in the old days before Johnny got hurt. Then the household went like clockwork, and the shop had earned an money 
sorry, and the shop had earned money for butter and butcher's meat once or twice a week. The sight of Johnny Tremaine standing there in the lower hall doing nothing, good for nothing, irritated her. Hurry, she snorted and waddled into the kitchen, Johnny on her heels. The fire was smoking, and she knelt down to mend it. When a smoking fire, it means it's not really burning. It's like the fire's gone out. It's just smoking. So she knelt down to mend it. It needs, like, more oxygen to kind of blow it up. Johnny might have done that while she was upstairs. Although Johnny was now looked upon as something of a black sheep, and Mrs. Lapham was no longer telling him he would end up picking rags, but on the gallows... He thought it behooved him to tell her just what he thought of Mr. Tweedy. I can see why that Tweedy has never been a master smith. He hasn't the force of character. As a man, he's no good, if he is a man, which I doubt. I think he is somebody's spinster aunt dressed up in men's clothes. <laughs> oh my gosh, he just insulted him so much. Mrs. Lapham heaved herself to her knees and brushed back her streaming hair with a red forearm. You don't say, her voice showed her exasperation. She had found Mr. Tweedy herself. She was trying to nurse him along to get the wary creature to sign her contract and marry one of her girls. And remember, her girls are 16 and 18, and she wants them to marry this 40-year-old bachelor who sounds like he's you know, well, as described, not manly. Yep, I do say, said Johnny. I've just been talking with him. He's no good. And he's here now? Yep, in the shop. That squeak pig is trying to horn in on breakfast. If the doors were all open, anyone in the shop could have heard Johnny's insults. Slowly, like a great sow pulling out of a wallow, Mrs. Lapham got to her feet glaring down at Johnny, her enormous bosom heaving. And I'm going to tell you what I think of that squeak pig. Without a word, and before he could finish his remarks or dodge, Mrs. Lapham gave him a resounding cuff on the ear. A cuff is a hit. She smacked him. Sometimes actions do speak louder than words, she said, and this is one of them times. You get right out of here, Johnny Tremaine. That tongue of yours isn't going to do any more damage in my house. Okay, now that's the end of section two. We'll have to do like a summary in a few minutes, but I'm going to go on with section three. Johnny grabbed his jacket. Scylla had not yet put food in it, pulled his tattered hat over his eyes, and stalked out. Since his accident, he had unconsciously taken to wearing his hat at a rakish angle, this, and the way he always kept his right hand thrust into his breeches pocket, gave him a slightly arrogant air. And a, a rakish angle is like off kilter, like at an angle. So if your hat is supposed to be worn straight over your brow, he'll tip it. Okay, rakish. Rake is uh, not, a, not a gentleman. Um, slightly arrogant air. The arrogance had always been there, of course, which we know, but formerly it had come out in pride in his work, not in the way he wore his hat and walked. He told no one what he did all day, and Mrs. Lapham was convinced that he had taken to, or was about to take to, evil ways. He did look at times both shabby and desperate, in other words, a potential criminal. Sometimes he looked so proud and fine, people thought he must be a great gentleman's son in misfortune. One thing he did not look like any more was a smart, industrious Boston apprentice. He walked down Fish Street to Anne, crossed Dock Square with Fanwheel Hall on his left. It was market day. He picked his way about the farm carts, the piles of whitish green cabbages, baskets of yellow corn, rows of plump pale, plucked turkeys, orange pumpkins, country cheeses, big as a baby's head. Some of the market folk, men and women, children and black slaves, called to him, seeing in the shabby, proud boy a possible rich customer. But others counted the pats of butter on their tables after he had passed by. They're counting them to make sure he didn't steal any. Without heeding anyone, he crossed Dock Square and in a moment's time stood beside the brick town house at the head of King Street. 
The lower floor of the townhouse was an open promenade, and here every day the merchants gathered on change. Not a merchant in sight. They did not rise as early as market folk. Suddenly, Johnny had an idea. Although seemingly he had tried every shop in Boston in search of a new master, he had not tried the merchants. From where he sat on the steps of the townhouse, he could look the brief length of King Street, which quickly and imperceptibly turned into Long Wharf, running for half a mile into the sea. It was the only wharf in Boston larger than Hancock's. There was not another wharf in all America so large, so famous, so rich. As at his own wharf, one side was built up solidly with counting houses, warehouses, sail lofts, stores. The other side was left open for ships. Already sailors, porters, riggers, and such were at work. He waited. It seemed to him for a long time, and then the clerks began to arrive. Counting house doors were unlocked. Warehouses were unchained. At last the merchants came, some striding down King Street, rosy-faced, double-chinned, known and greeted by everyone, apparently knowing and greeting everyone in return. Some came in chaises, gigs, those are the little things that horses are pulling. Some had sour, gimlet-eyed faces. Some had not yet lost the rolling gait of sea captains. Johnny saw the same gray horse and gig with the arms upon the door that had carried John Hancock to the Laphams last July, trot quickly down King Street onto Long Wharf. Although Mr. Hancock had recently bought Hancock's Wharf, his principal place of business was on Long. Mr. Hancock has on a cherry red coat, Johnny thought. He drives the horse himself, but now he is getting out, telling that dressed-up doll of a black boy to put his horse up for him. Johnny decided he would start at the top of the merchants and work down. Only, of course, skipping merchant light. He'd go first to John Hancock. From where he sat, he could see that a great ship was slowly warping in, no coaster this, no mere sugar boat from the sugar isles, a number of fashionably dressed young men, as well as the usual dock hands and porters, were crowding about to welcome her. There was the heavy clatter of a great coach almost beside him, and a coachman was bawling to lesser folk, "'Make way! Make way!' Black horses in glittering silver-mounted harnesses, the rumble and rattle of a ruby coach on cobbles, and on the door panel, the familiar crest, a rising eye. <gasps> Who's coming? Half seen inside, Merchant Jonathan Light. Evidently, he had just heard his ship was in and had come down from his mansion on Beacon Hill in a hurry. He was still struggling with the lace about his throat like a fancy collar. Johnny left his seat and strolled down the wharf to watch. No one had ever told him not to watch the lights, but he always felt guilty when he did. From afar, he knew them all. He knew, for instance, that Mr. Light had a broken front tooth. He knew Mrs. Light was dead, and two sons had been drowned as boys, and girls had died in infancy. This he could read upon the slate gravestones of Copse Hill. And remember, he's been hanging out a lot there. He knew that besides the townhouse on Beacon Hill, there was a country seat at Milton. And he knew that Lavinia Light had spent the last summer in London. Now she was back in Boston once more. She was very tall for a woman, slender and graceful, and moved slowly down the gangplank with the stately self-consciousness, which happened to be the fashionable gait for a lady at the moment. A hundred times before, Johnny had stopped on the streets of Boston or before her house to watch her, but he but one more gaping face in a crowd, she the accepted reigning belle, and when it's B-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, that means beauty of the day. He admired her odd, strong beauty, which unlike her regal gait, regal meaning royal, was not of the fashionable type. Okay, so she has this strong beauty, but it doesn't look fashionable. 
To begin with, well, like I said before, she was too tall. And golden curls, pink and white skin were the mode. That means that's popular. She was bl a black-haired woman, and only for balls and such was she powdered and curled. In contrast, her skin was dead white. If you want to think of Snow White, there's an image for you. Her features were clear-cut enough to justify the poems written to her in London and even here in Boston, comparing her to a classic goddess. There was only one flaw to her marble beauty. Between the low, sweeping black brows was a tiny perpendicular line. Once and once only the master hand that carved her face had let the chisel slip. This blemish was odd enough for a young lady still in her twenties. It boded no good for the peace of mind of those about her, nor for her own. Now she was all glitter and smiles, greeting the young gentleman who had come to meet her. Johnny did not notice what she wore, but the mantua makers, dressmakers, milliners, glovers, and jewelers all knew that whatever Lavinia Light brought back from London would set Boston styles for the winter. Oh, Papa, Papa, she suddenly exclaimed. There was an urgency in her voice, a soft flash in her eyes none of the young men's faces had called forth. Like any country girl, merely glad to be home again, she flung herself into her father's arms. Spiritually, Johnny shrugged, determined to be neither over-impressed nor envious. That overdressed moppet, that lean beanpole, for Miss Lavinia was lean in comparison to Madge and Dorcas, who had always been held up to Johnny as the end-all of feminine beauty. So basically, all Johnny knows is that Madge and Dorcas, if they're larger for women, that is what the standard of beauty is, because Mrs. Lapham has always told him so. Isana being very thin is, like, gonna die, according to Mrs. Lapham. She's good for nothing. So when Johnny sees Miss Lavinia and she's thin, he's like, hmm, not healthy. So he just thinks of it as being unhealthy. Okay. <sighs> Bad-tempered, too. I hope she kills herself over eating cakes and plum pudding, turkeys with stuffing and gravy, hot white rolls. Oh, his stomach was gnawing at him. He forgot Lavinia Light as... He thought of the wonderful things it was her privilege to overeat if she wished. Surely by now enough time had passed since John Hancock's arrival at his counting house so that he would be ready to talk to a likely boy looking for work. His hand might be good enough for a cabin boy. Johnny found one does not step into a great merchant's counting house and see the merchant as easily as one steps into a shop and sees the master artisan kind of like he did with Paul Revere. Although he had made up his mind that he would begin his conversation with Mr. Hancock by explaining he had a burned hand, he did not see any reason why he should explain to the clerk who stopped him in the outer office. All he said was that he wanted work. The clerk asked him if he could read and write. He said he could. The thin, weak-eyed gentleman gave him a mortgage and told him to read that this he read well. Then Mr. Hancock, who had been sitting alone over his little hearth fire in the back office, came out. He had been attracted by the quality of the boy's voice, for although Johnny often spoke in the rougher, slurring manner of Hancock's wharf, in reading he reverted to the cleaner speech his mother had taught him, and probably that he had been reading the Bible with at Mr. Lapham's. Mr. Hancock did not recognize him as the apprentice of Mr. Lappin, who had rashly promised a sugar basin in time for his Aunt Lydia's birthday. And then the old man had been forced at the last to admit he could not do it. Add this, my lad, he said, handing Johnny an invoice he held in his hand. Johnny added easily. He was given a few more simple sums, which he did in his head looking good. The clerk and merchant exchanged glances. Mr. Hancock said, 
If your handwriting is as good as your reading and ciphering, I promise you a place right here in my counting house. I've been put to it to find just the right boy. Your writing. I've been taught to write, but Johnny was suddenly frightened. The clerk put a piece of paper before him and inked a pen. Write, John Hancock, Esquire. Johnny stubbornly stared at the paper. At last, he had found a place where he wanted to be, and he knew that ever and again, boys who started working for great merchants became great merchants themselves. Surely, surely, if only he tried hard enough, he could do it. He could write for the length of just John Hancock, Esquire. His hand shot out of his pocket, grasped the pen. The letters were as clumsy as though written with a left hand. Ugh, the clerk laughed. Mr. Hancock, huh, I've never seen worse writing. The merchant said, my boy, you must have been rattled. Surely you can do better than that. Johnny stared at his miserable scratches. God help me, he whispered. It is the best I can do. Why, the lad has a crippled hand. Look, Mr. Hancock. Mr. Hancock quickly averted his fine eyes. Run away, boy, run away. You knew you could not do the work, and yet you came and took up my valuable time. And But I thought maybe you could ship me as a cabin boy and carry the captain's grog and be brisk and useful to him? No, no, my captains want whole boys. So now, go away, please. <sighs> Doesn't that just hurt you? Johnny wandered off. I burned my hand making you a silver basin. Now it's go away, please. He flung himself down in the shadow of a sail loft for the late September day was warm as summer. He could hear the tap of shipwright's hammers, the creak of wooden wheels, a boatswain's whistle. Everywhere, boys and men were at work. Only he was idle. He saw picking his way delicately around barrels of molasses, bales, ox teams, a familiar, fantastic figure. It was Mr. Hancock's little black slave, Jehu. He was looking from side to side. When he saw Johnny, he went to him and said like a parrot, My master, Mr. John Hancock Esquire, has commanded me to give this purse to the poor work boy in the broken shoes who just left his counting house and to tell him that he wishes him well. Johnny took the purse. It was heavy. That much copper would provide him with food for days. He opened it. It was not copper, but silver. John Hancock had not been able to look at the crippled hand, nor could he help but make this handsome present. He's got guilt. Okay? He's doing what he thinks, Mr. Hancock is doing what he thinks he needs to do to kind of save face. Oh, you crippled person, you get out of my sight. Back in those days, nobody would would had like heart or compassion for, uh, for someone who was injured. And I'm sure John Hancock knows who Johnny is. And so he sends not copper, but silver to kind of assist him in his survival. So, uh, oh yeah, become a subscriber and get updates when I'm doing more. We're only on page 65 out of 300 pages. And so you're going to want updates of this book. See you on the next